June 23rd. Clear and cool. Last night the water came down the creek a-booming, bringing the rocks and brush before it. A water spout bursted in the mountains. It made a big lumbering when it came, and we have plenty of water this morning, and it is as cold as ice. We came 10 miles over rough roads to Gorilla Station. Negroes are stationed here. They wanted to keep us from passing. They said we had smallpox. We passed on by them, drove up to a big pond, and turned the horses out and got dinner. There is another big train of Texas going to the land of gold, they think. We filled our water kegs with water and came five miles and camped for the night out on the plain with plenty of grass and wood. June 24. Clear and windy. We came about five miles over rocky roads and found water in Gorilla Creek. We stopped, turned the horses out, and will rest a while. Here is another train of Texans with a big drove of cattle on the way to California. We stayed two or three hours to eat dinner, then started and came about 10 miles and made a dry camp out on the plain with tolerable good grass, but no wood. We had to cook with weeds and the wind was blowing so hard we could hardly stand up. It blew our fire away as fast as we could build it. Our wagons rock and shake like they would go over. Frank is on guard tonight. He is complaining very much. During these days, the Shacklefords were in the territories of the Mescalero Apache and the Lupan Apache. I'm Jen Glabius, and this is the Halanaki Deep Dive, a podcast about the process of mapping and analysis for historical and archaeological research using open source tools. In this episode, I'll discuss Barilla Station, what Bruce Shackelford uh, mistakenly called Gorilla. It's actually Barilla Station. But I'll discuss Barilla Station using the diary of Harriet Bunyard, who passed the Shackelfords during these days, going to California from Texas. Then I'll talk about black soldiers, uh, who are also known as Buffalo Soldiers, and Roos' attitude towards them. And I'll finish up with an update on mapping and the progress I'm making. Let's dive in. So where I'm going to start today is reading the two entries from another diarist, Harriet Bunyard, for the same two days as the, the diary entries for Ruth Shackle for June 23rd and 24th. This diary is also in Covered Wagon Women, Volume 9. It's the, the diary after Ruth's 1868 diary. And Harriet Bunyard and her family were going from Texas to California, so they actually crossed paths during these days. All right, so here's Harriet Bunyard's diary. June 23rd. Cool and pleasant morning. All ready to start early. They told us that there was plenty water in about 12 miles from where we were, so we did not fill our barrels, only filled our small kegs. To our disappointment, the water was all dried up, and we had to go 25 miles in place of 12, so we had no drinking water all the evening. We found some water standing in a pond, but not enough for our stock. It was then an hour after sunset, but the moon was shining brightly, so we camped and put all our stock in the corral without letting them eat any, as they all wanted water. So we started next morning before breakfast and went eight miles to Barella Springs. Here we found a cold, pure water well at the stage stand, and a spring up in the mountains. June 24. Remained here until evening, filled our barrels with water, and went short distance to better range. Ma is sick, has the flux. Quite a number on the train has the same complaint. And that's the end of Harriet Bunyard's diary entries that I'm going to read. And just a couple of things to note. So the... The Bunyards were traveling the opposite direction from the Shacklefords, and you can tell that the weather was different. Like, the Shacklefords on the 23rd experienced a thunderstorm, and it must not have been in the location where the Bunyards were. At least Harriet Bunyard didn't talk about it at all. You can also tell that the Shacklefords were much more experienced at traveling than the Bunyards. Like, Anytime the Shacklefords can fill up with water, they seem to do that. And the Bunyards, who had been traveling for at least a month by this point, they did not take the opportunity to fill up their water barrels and only filled their small kegs, and then they paid for it when there wasn't water 
where they had told there would be water. And another thing to note, something that Harriet Bunyard tells us is that Barilla Springs had a stage stand and then the spring up in the mountains. And she doesn't mention that there were soldiers stationed there, which Ruth does tell us, although Ruth Shackleford doesn't tell us that it was a stage stand. Although since most of the places that the Shacklefords were stopping, like since they left California, there were all these stage stands that had been along the Butterfield Overland Mail Route. So Barilla Station, which Ruth called Gorilla Station, but it's Barilla, B-A-R-I-L-L-A, was another of those Butterfield Overland Mail stations. So during these two days... I'm not sure which group of these. Ruth talked about two different parties of Texans going to California that they passed. On the 23rd, they passed a big train of Texans going to the land of gold. And then on the 24th, they passed a train of Texans that had a big drove of cattle on their way to California. And I suspect that second one were the Bunyards because I think they had cattle with them. What's interesting is... So the Shacklefords at this point, the soldiers stationed at Barilla Station don't want the Shacklefords party to actually pass by them because they think that the Shacklefords had smallpox. And this was going from earlier, an earlier station that the Shacklefords had gone by. Three people, I think three men in the Shacklefords party, they didn't know what they had, but they were suspected of having smallpox, which is highly infectious and dangerous. And so it makes sense that if they have smallpox smallpox in their in their wagon train that you don't want them to be near anybody else. You don't want anyone else to get infected with smallpox. So the word has gone down the line that the Shackleford's wagon train had smallpox. And so the this information had been passed down to different stations, including Barilla Station. So after that word had been passed down, but before the Shacklefords actually reached Berlin Station, a doctor had seen those three men and determined that they really didn't have smallpox. But it seems like that that information didn't also get passed down the line. So the Shacklefords have information that they don't have smallpox, but the soldiers at different stations haven't been told that. And so this is why the Shacklefords don't obey the orders of the soldiers. And that's really interesting. So Ruth makes sure to tell us that there are black soldiers stationed there. And she says they wanted to keep us from passing. And again, it's the reason. They said we had smallpox. And then she says we passed on by them. So they disregarded the orders. Now the Shacklefords know that they didn't have smallpox. But it also makes me wonder about their attitude towards black soldiers and the authority of black soldiers. Like, what does this say about the Shacklefords themselves? And so with that, I want to talk a little bit about the Buffalo Soldiers, as black soldiers during this time were known as. The information that I'm going to talk about the Buffalo Soldiers with comes from two books that I checked out from my local library. One was by William H. Lucky called The Buffalo Soldiers, a narrative of the Negro cavalry in the West. And the other one was a book by Charles L. Kenner called Buffalo Soldiers and Officers of the Ninth Cavalry, 1867 to 1898. And I'll put links to where you can find them uh, in the show notes. In, on July 23rd, 1866, the U.S. Congress mandated that in the post-Civil War military, two out of 10 cavalry companies and four out of 45 infantry companies, which later became two out of 25 infantry companies, that two cavalry, four infantry were to consist of black enlisted men with white officers. So there were two cavalry companies that were to be organized, the 9th Cavalry and the 10th Cavalry. We're going to focus on the 9th Cavalry because that's probably who the Shacklefords actually interacted with when they came to Texas. So all 12 companies of the 9th Cavalry were organized by February 1867, 
although they only had 11 officers, which caused problems as they were going to their next station. So organized in February 1867, and the 9th Cavalry was transferred to Texas in March 1867, so shortly after organization. And they were sent to take over Fort Stockton and Davis in May of 1868. So February organized, March go to Texas, May, hey, now you're in charge of Fort Stockton and Davis. And the 9th Cavalry, the black soldiers in the 9th Cavalry basically had to rebuild those forts because they had been destroyed during the Civil War. And it looks like in... Like 1867 to 1898, in Texas, the 9th Cavalry covered was stationed in many of the forts there, including Fort Bliss, Fort Quitman, Davis, Stockton, and Concha, which are all forts that I think the, the Shackelfords passed by. I know that they did pass by the first three, three or four. And so they... And actually from Ruth's diary, we know that there were black soldiers in also stationed at the former stage stations. So not just at the forts, but they had been placed at different smaller locations along the route. So here's a little summary of where up to this point, up to June 23rd, where the Shackelfords had encountered black soldiers of the 9th Cavalry. So June 7th, they had passed Fort Quitman. June 13th, um, there were a company of black soldiers at Eagle Springs. And this is when the Shacklefords were suspected of having smallpox and the word was sent ahead. Uh, June 17th, they encountered black men at Dead Man's Hole, another station. June 18th at Barrel Springs. June 19th at Fort Davis which also had white soldiers as well as black soldiers, June 23rd at Brula Station, and then the next, and I think the last time they encountered black soldiers was June 25th at Leon Holes, which was another stage stand. The 9th Cavalry with the black soldiers had been sent out in 1867. So this is 1868 when the Shacklefords passed through. So there had been over a year that the forts could be established and that the the companies of soldiers, soldiers of the 9th Cavalry could be placed at different stage stations to guard the road. That spring and summer of 1868 involved a lot of raids by indigenous tribes, the, the Mescalero and the Lipan Apache in West Texas. And so the 9th Cavalry was directly coming into conflict with those Apache tribes. So the the Shacklefords passed through in late June. On the 12th of September in 1868, there was what was called the Battle of Horsehead Hills, where the 9th Cavalry uh, fought against Lipan Apaches south of Fort Davis. So a place that the Shacklefords had passed by on like June 18th. And there was other fighting in September 26th, 1868, where a wagon train near Fort Stockton was uh, attacked by 200 Apaches. So there was a lot of fighting that went on back and forth between the Apache and the Black soldiers of the 9th and later the 10th Cavalry. This goes on through all the wars with like uh, Cochise and then Geronimo, so into Arizona as well. There's constant fighting like through these years. But in addition to fighting, the black soldiers of the 9th and 10th Cavalry, they also had to deal with the prejudice of the local people, the people who they were sent there to protect. And this happened all over the place. Keeping in mind that late 1860s, late 1860s Texas was Texas under reconstruction. And so there was a lot of anger directed towards black people in general. And this included um, problems for the black enlisted soldiers. There was just local prejudice as well that um, in June of 1869, Private Boston Henry of F Troop was just killed by a white local farmer named John Jackson. So just like, all right, 
I don't like you. I'm going to kill you. Or he had some other problems like, oh, I'm just going to shoot a black man. So in addition to fighting the Apache, like the black soldiers also had to um, deal with the, the problems of the white population that they were sent to guard. So super difficult situation. But this brings me to, to Ruth Shackelford's attitude towards black people, which I talked about a bit on an earlier episode. And on that episode, when the episode where I talk about Sweet Freedom's Plains, I mentioned I had gone through and read this 1868 diary again because I was looking for any mentions of black people. And really the only mentions are through here, like in Texas, where the Shackelfords encounter these black soldiers. And Ruth makes sure to mention that this is where they saw black soldiers. And I think I speculated then that I wondered it was, it was because she, it was so unusual seeing the black soldiers in kind of a, a form of authority or in a situation that she wasn't used to, that maybe that's why she mentioned it. Because otherwise she makes no mentions of black people at all on in either the 1865 or otherwise in this 1868 diary. And we know that there were black people all over the trails and in California and everywhere. And she just doesn't mention them, except in this one circumstance of when they are soldiers. Now, lately, um, I've been conversing with my uncle Chuck, who's our family historian, who's interested in genealogy. And we started collaborating a bit on the Shackelford research because I'm interested in putting context to these diaries eventually. So first do the mapping and then put things into context. And there's definitely some family history that I've learned since the last episode. I, and I'll probably get into that in a later episode. I, I will get into that in a, on a later episode. But overall, I suspect that the Shackelfords were Southern sympathizers. And this comes from a few reasons. Frank's, Frank Shackelford's father, Morgan, had moved the family from Virginia to Boone County, Missouri in the 1840s. And so they started out from Virginia. So they probably had Southern sympathies anyway. And then I also know from the family records that Morgan had an enslaved black woman um, that he had four children with, which is difficult to see. Um, so Frank had some half siblings who were black. Not that he would have mentioned it. So I also suspect that the Gatewoods, that Atwell Gatewood, Frank's brother-in-law, also had Southern sympathies. And it, it's possible that Atwell Gatewood had owned a slave in 1860, according to the census. It seems pretty likely that the Shacklefords and the people that they were traveling with were sympathetic to Southerners. I looked at Sarah Raymond Herndon's Days on the Plains. Um, remember, she also traveled in the wagon train with the Shacklefords in 1865 part of the way. And so I reread it um, after talking with my uncle Chuck. And... I really feel like they were Southern sympathizers based on that. But I need to do more research and possibly look at the families that the Shacklefords were traveling with a little bit more. Because I think that would build a better picture. Like these people traveling from Missouri in 1865 after the surrender of Lee, although it doesn't seem like they knew it, but they're traveling and leaving Missouri in 1865. I'm still trying to figure that out. With that, I also want to talk a little bit about the mapping that I'm doing. And again, this was helped. I was going back and forth with my Uncle Chuck. And we're talking about the holes in the route that I, I've seen. Like the area between Plattsmouth and Fort Kearney in Nebraska. I really don't know where they went. I, they don't follow the plat the entire way across. They kind of 
shortcut from Plattsmouth towards Ashland, and then at Ashland they don't follow the entire oxbow of the Platte River. And they do join up with it. And it, like a few days into the journey, they're like, all right, and now we're going by the plat. But I really had no idea exactly where they went. So I did that reread of Days on the Plains by Sarah Herndon. And in that section between Plattsmouth and Fort Kearney, she mentions that they were stopped, that the wagon train was stopping at stage stations. And so I was like, all right, so they're following a stage route, which means they're probably following a road, something that was established route for the stages. I went looking for a map of stage routes in that area, which I didn't find. But while doing that, I ran across an article that talked about the process of mapping stage routes in Colorado. And reading that article, they, the author mentioned using plats, maps from the General Land Office, the GLO, which is part of the Bureau of Land Management. And these are the maps that establish the property in the United States. So not across the, the East Coast where everything was later, but everything from like Ohio West, I think excluding Texas too, because they had their own system from when they were independent. But these maps lay out the, the system of, of townships, which are divided into sections. And this is called the Public Land Survey System. If you want to do some more reading about the history of that system and get an understanding of it, I really recommend the book Measuring America by Andrew Linklater, and I'll put a, a link to that book as well in the show notes. It's really interesting how this system was established and actually how it worked moving across the, the United States. What is useful for my problem of where is the road where the Shacklefords and the stages had gone in this part of Nebraska is that the southern part of Nebraska near the Platte River was platted. It was mapped in the 1850s and 1860s. So before there were railroads, because the railroad routes take precedence. But before then, they were platted. And most of these maps which are, it'll have like one township on each map. And most of them along this route that the Shacklefords must, must have taken include the roads. So they include the road from Plattsmouth to Ashland and then to get to the, to Fort Kearney, which is great. They're all online and I'll put a link to the BLM GLO Platts if you want to go look for the Platts where you're from. They were all drawn at different times. You can look at the surveyor who did it, information about what office they were working from. Really interesting stuff, just nice historical documents. And you can also download these individual plats as a PDF or a JPEG or another raster format called Mr. Sid. So I spent some time last week downloading, I forget how many tons of plats I uh these maps I downloaded, all the ones across Nebraska, basically, that followed their route. Um, so I have these maps. They all need to be georeferenced um, so that I know where the location is. So I'll probably be working on that in the next few weeks. And I'll do that using um, a shapefile I have of sections across Nebraska. Or actually, it's a shapefile that shows all the townships in Nebraska. So it gives me the corners for each one that I'll be able to georeference, uh, match up the corners for each township on these plat on these GLO maps. And after that, I'll be able to I run the georeferencing. Once I have this all georeferenced, then I can go through and digitize the roads, or just use that layer to figure out approximately where the the Shacklefords would have been. So this this will be great, really useful information. Unfortunately, I looked for my other spots that where I don't really have much information in Wyoming, in eastern and then western of Wyoming, and 
Unfortunately, it looks like those plats, those maps were drawn in the 1870s, so after there were railroads. So they don't include earlier roads. Um, so I'll have to figure out some other way to get that information. But I figure they basically had to be following stage routes. So maybe there's some other map, and I'll just keep, have to keep looking for that. All right, so... That's it for this episode, where I talked about Brilla Station and where the Shackelfords intersected with another group, the Harriet Benyard group, who were traveling from Texas to California. One of the groups that Bruce Shackelford was saying, oh, they think it's a land of gold, so not great. I also talked about the black soldiers of the Ninth Cavalry, the so-called Buffalo Soldiers, and their time in Texas. And Ruth Shackelford actually adds some information that these companies of these soldiers weren't just at the forts, but they were also placed at different stage stations along Western Texas as well. And then I talked about the progress made with the mapping. Um, I do want to note that I'm taking vacation next week. So your next episode will be in three weeks instead of two. Thanks for listening. Email questions or comments to deepdive at helenaki.com or ask them on the Helenaki Deep Dive Facebook page. Show notes with links to resources mentioned in this episode are available at helenaki.com. That's H-E-L-O-N-A-K-I dot com. You can also find ways to support the show at helenaki.com slash support. The Helenaki Deep Dive is written and produced by me, Jen Globius of The Helenaki. The theme music is Deep Ocean Instrumental by Dan O of danosongs.com. Thanks for listening.